Good morning, folks. Sorry for the five minute delay. I don't know. Facebook didn't like me this morning. Had to go back through and do all of my passwords and all of that kind of thing. But it looks like we're good now. So here we are live on Sunday morning. It's Lord's Day live and I'm glad to have you with me. Got a lot to cover this morning and uh, hope that you'll I don't know. Buckle up your seatbelts and get after it. I'm actually going to draw on my television today, so you're going to need to wait for that. It's going to be a big deal. Cindy got me set up with something that I'm pretty excited about using, and I think it will be something that uh, we can use in the future with uh, SBS, School of Biblical Studies, and various things with with my approach to how we study Scripture. I love to let the Bible interpret the Bible, and so one of the things I like to do is throw a passage on the script on the screen, and then just show you how words within the same text complement each other. And anyhow, I'm going to draw on the screen here in just a minute, so it's going to be good. Lord's Day Live, and I think the first thing we do is the Bible class, isn't it? Yeah, Bible class. All right. I promised you last time that we were going to have a part two, part two to our prophecy. We've already covered parallels. We've covered priming. And uh, we're into prophecy. Last week we talked about prophecy and all those crazy cool prophecies that were made specifically about Jesus. Uh, today, this prophecy doesn't have anything specifically to do with Jesus, but it's, it's one of the most amazing prophecies in all of the scriptures. The reason is because it was stated by the prophet over a hundred years before the guy who would fulfill the prophecy was even born. And so it shows you, again, that God is in control of his message. He protects his message. He promotes his message. And uh, he, he's able to even predict things within his message that provides for you and I evidence that, yes, you can trust the Bible. It is God's word. And uh, so you can take it and you can establish your life on it. You can bank your eternity on it. And, of course, for the purposes of this class and the sermon time following, um, interpreting the Bible. If the Bible is trustworthy, worthy, it comes from God, you can prove that by parallels, priming, and prophecy, then you can let the Bible interpret the Bible. And I know, you've probably heard enough of that, but you'll hear more of it if you stick around with me very long. All right, here we go. One of the most amazing prophecies in all of Scripture has to do with the, the city of Babylon. Now, some of you are aware about Babylon, uh, where it plays out in the timeline, etc. And I'm going to show you something on the map here in a minute. That's what I'm going to draw on the tele television. But uh, this is an artist's rendering of Babylon. I'm sure it, was, it looked remarkably different, I suspect, but nobody has a picture, obviously. And so this is what his viewpoint was. And, I, and you need to notice the mode here. You need to notice the river coming right down. Uh, that's the Euphrates. And it's coming right down the middle of the city. That's going to play an important part into our prophecy here. Um, but before we go there, I needed to share with you kind of a, a geographic perspective of where Babylon is. Here's the city of Jerusalem, most famous city in all the world. Okay, I'm going to show you how to locate that here in just a minute when I draw on my television. If you go straight east from Jerusalem, almost directly east from Jerusalem, you're going to come to Ur of the Chaldees. Now, that's famous because that's where one of the reboots, you might call it, happened. Remember, that's Abraham's going to start out from Ur of the Chaldees. He's going to travel up around the Fertile Crescent. He's going to come down into, into the Promised Land here. Okay, But Ur of the Chaldees, now if you go straight east of Jerusalem, Ur... And then you follow the Euphrates River north, actually it's kind of northwest, you're going to eventually come to the ancient ruins of Babylon, which lie, I'm told, about 60 miles south of modern-day Baghdad. Uh, I, I did the uh, Google Maps thing, or whatever you call that, and it uh, GPS thing. It's a, a little less than 600 miles from here to here, six, a little less than 600 miles. I give you a perspective uh, somewhere between the distance between New Orleans, Louisiana, and St. Louis, Missouri. Many of us have traveled that route. Uh, if you come up, what is that, 55? And you travel that route, it's about 600 miles. Uh, but anyhow, that's the distance that you have. The problem is there's a massive desert right here. Horrible, horrible desert. Few people, even today, want to go through that particular desert. And so especially back in the day of Abraham, that he's going to take, and he, because he's got all this flocks and he's got his cattle and all that, he's going to stay along the river. And the river comes way up here, and it's going to come way down in here. Okay. Now here, here's the exciting part. I've got to watch my time. Here's the exciting part. I get, I get a draw on my television. Now you probably can already see it, but there's a film here. Okay. Cindy got me this stuff. You can put it on your TV, and you can draw right on the TV. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite fit the whole television, so i got to watch myself so I don't draw on the other thing. 
Boot blob banana boat with bubbles being bounced beside balloons. Silly phrase. I get that. In the future, you're going to hear more about it because that's one of the phrases that I teach young people that travel across the country as I'm the director of the Missionaries for America program. It's one of the ways that you can picture in your mind a geographic map of the Bible lands. Now, I'm not going to deal with all of it. In fact, I'm only going to deal with the beside balloons last part of this this morning. But stick with me on Sunday morning, Lord's Day Live, because we're going to, in the future, I'm going to teach you about biblical geography, simple ways to, to memorize spots on the map, so that when you have a preacher or a teacher who's talking to you about a particular city, you can go to that spot in your head, and you can know where that's supposed to be. All right, we're going to just deal with the balloons. This is the Mediterranean Sea, okay? This is the Med Sea, and there's the... That's the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, maybe I should, if I took you backwards here, watch this. Okay, you see, the tr here's the Mediterranean Sea. We're fixing to draw this map. Mediterranean Sea? Okay. All right, so there's the Med. Beside the Med, you've got the Sea of Galilee, and you've got the Jordan River, and you've got the Dead Sea. And the way I teach young people is, uh, it looks like balloons, okay? Boot blob banana boat with bubbles being balanced beside, we're at the balloons part, balloons. This looks like a balloon with a streamer under it. And the Dead Sea looks like a balloon that's lost all of its helium and it's going south, all right? And so that's the way you remember that. There's also another balloon, and that balloon's way over here. And this balloon has two streamers that actually come out of it like that. Very important here in just a moment. We'll talk about that. Most famous city in all the world. And it's very important that you get this one in your head because this will allow you to identify other spots on the biblical timeline or biblical geographic map. If you go to the top of the Dead Sea and just slightly to the west, and put you a dot right there. That's Jerusalem. That is Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jeru. Jerusalem. How's that? Jerusalem. All right. Now, remember what I've already told you. Now, if you go straight east from there, you're going to get a spot in the map. That's going to be Ur. Okay. And then you go north of there, and you're going to get Babylon. Okay, I just wanted to give you a perspective, and again, in the future times together, we're going to talk more about this. I'm going to show you how to memorize the map and all that. We'll talk about Egypt, we'll talk about Cyprus, we're going to come over here to Italy, all these kind of things where we deal with Paul's missionary journeys, etc. But I wanted to give you a perspective of where Babylon is, specifically, in your mind. All right. Now that I wrote all over my screen, i got to erase the screen, because the next thing we do doesn't need to have stuff written all over it. All right, so how's that look? You guys okay with that? Got that line right there. Okay, we good? All right, here you go. Now we get back to the discussion of Babylon. The Babylon prophecy centers around 15 specific predictions that were made by Isaiah over 100 years before they occur. Really interesting stuff. Uh, and I don't, I, we, I'm watching my time. I've got to be very, very careful because I want to tell you the story. So I, I can't really read all of them. But if you come down this list, and by the way, teachers take a picture of this. You can discuss this later after I get off of here. But there's a lot of things that are going to happen. Uh, Israel, uh, Jerusalem is going to be laid waste to. That's going to happen prior to Cyrus. Uh, it's, uh, uh, the, uh, let's see, the deep waters will go dry. That's an interesting part of the prophecy. We'll see that here in just a moment. A guy named Cyrus is going to be specifically named by God a hundred years before he ever comes on the scene. Let's see, there's other things here. Uh, Cyrus will say that Jerusalem will, uh, shall be built. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, da, 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 da. uh, come on down here. Oh, uh, the crooked places will be made straight. Very important prophecy. And uh, bars will be broken. The leave gates will be opened. Show you that in just a moment. This is a really interesting one. Almost funny if it wasn't so sad. Uh, Isaiah 45, 1 says that God will loose the loins of the kings before Cyrus. In other words, they'll wet their pants. And uh, that, ex that exact thing happens in Scripture. A hundred years before the guy wets his pants because he's so afraid of what's happening, it happens. <laughs> uh, God predicts it, that it's going to happen. It's really, really, really neat prophecy. All right, let's see here. Oh, yeah, okay, there's the picture. Now, I don't like reading. Good good speakers don't generally just read things off. But there's so many details in this and specifics in this. And I'm going to read this to you. Teachers, if you want the specifics, I'm happy to email it to you. What I need you to do is, is uh, leave me a message here with your email address or send it to me in private message or whatever. And I will, I'll send you this. But please ask for specifically the Babylon prophecy. And I'll send you this particular reading. Did you know the ancient city of Babylon was 15 miles square, straddled the mighty Euphrates River? It's 
15 miles square, and it straddles the river. In ancient times, conquering armies would often eliminate a city's water supply to force the citizens into surrender. Babylon, however, was a huge city, and its water supply was much more difficult to cut off. The mighty Euphrates River not only ran through the city and provided an ample supply of water for each household, it also provided plenty of water for a deep, wide moat that completely surrounded the city wall. And you see the artist rendering here of the moat all the way around. So you've got a river that runs smack dab through the middle. One of the ways, as I said, that... Conquering armies in the past would have taken care of this kind of a situation is they would just cut off the water supply and then the folks would have to, you know, the, the, come outside the gate in order to get water. Problem with Babylon is that they've got the, they've got an entire river that runs through, but there's more. Directly inside the moat rose an enormous wall made of a huge solid bricks. This is the wall that we're referring to here. And this isn't a very good rendering of this because, well, you'll see in a minute. Uh, it was 20 feet thick, and it extended 35 feet below and 300 feet above the ground surface, according to the notes that I've got. Beyond the first wall was a space of about 40 feet, and then another 20-foot thick wall, just like the first. In the early days of Babylon, it was thought that if an army penetrated the first wall, that they would get stuck between the first wall and the second wall, giving the folks inside the city time to throw boulders and hot oil and all that kind of stuff on them. It was what they call an impregnable city. You couldn't breach the outer walls because, the, the, because of what was happening there. Um, the people of the city, during the, after, it was being, after it was constructed, they began to dump their garbage in between the two walls, and eventually it filled up. During the years that followed, the space between the walls was used as a garbage dump. As I just said, eventually the space between them became completely filled with debris. This made a solid wall, 300 feet high, 80 feet thick. Chariots could drive six abreast, I mean six side by side, on top of this totally impenetrable wall. It was an amazing city. The wall had 250 lookout towers. You can see a bunch of them all the way around here. I didn't take time to count them. You can go ahead if you want to. The Euphrates River made a bend and then went under the wall of the city. The tunnel under the wall was made secure by two huge iron gates that extended to the bottom of the river. As the river came out from underneath the mighty wall and into the city, it was guarded by two huge walls that ran on either side of the river and stretched the length of Babylon. See, there's walls here. So even if you got through the gates here, you still had these two walls on either side. You couldn't get into the city. During the king, here's where it gets interesting, though, with regards to the prophecy. During the king of Nebuchadnezzar, the king Nebuchadnezzar, he's the guy who doubts God and has to go out and graze on the hillside like an ox and whatever, okay? Eventually, God gets his attention. But during that day, Babylon waged war on Israel, raided it, laid it to waste, and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Now, that was in the prophecy we saw in the previous ones. I, I don't have time to go back there. Years later, Nebuchadnezzar died, and he left his kingdom to one of his sons, Maybe a grandson. We're not sure how that plays out. But his name was Belshazzar. This is the guy that wets his pants. Belshazzar, one fateful night, was having a party with his friends and he got drunk. During their drunken orgy, they abused the holy vessels that his father had taken from the temple of Jerusalem years prior. This action kindled God's wrath against Belshazzar and he prepared an armless hand to write a message on the wall near the king. Daniel was called to interpret the message, and it was simple. The days of this king has ended. Uh, Daniel says that the armless hands uh, caused such fear within the king that, and I'm quoting, his loins were loose and his knees smote one against the other. In other words, his knees were knocking and he's wet in his pants. That's Daniel 5.30, read it for yourself. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. But this is where it gets good. Belshazzar's kingdom was conquered in a very interesting manner. A man named Cyrus, this is the same dude who Isaiah is prophesying about 100 years before the guy even gets born. A man named Cyrus dug a huge ditch to straighten out the Euphrates River. Meaning, that remember I said that the Euphrates kind of makes a bend? Well, he took that bend and he straightened it out so that it bypassed the city. Now, it had taken a lot of work, I get that, but he eventually cut off the water supply and the river is running around the city now instead of running through it. When the ditch was complete, the river's path had, uh, was changed, and the old water bed went dry. The two river gates were mysteriously left open. So, why? Because the king's drunk, 
And so he leaves the, he, he, he leaves the, and they're, they're having a party time in the inside. They, they think they're impregnable. They think they're inconquerable. They think that nobody can get to us. And so they fail to even shut the gates that night. They were left open probably because of the drunken party. Cyrus's army marched right up the riverbed and into the palace. Belshazzar was killed and the kingdom was taken. That night, the unconquerable city of Babylon fell without even a major battle. Cyrus, the new king, later ordered, watch it, that the Jews return to their homeland, rebuild their cities, and relay the foundations for the temple. <laughs> All this would serve as nothing more than an interesting story lesson or history lesson, I should say, if it were not for the fact that Isaiah prophesied all these events 150 years before they came about. The recent discovery of the Dead Sea, Dead sea Scrolls shows us that the writings of Isaiah are authentic. Each of the 15 points that I showed you in the previous slides, even the, each of those 15 points of prophecy was exactly fulfilled as Isaiah foretold. Verification of this can be found in the writings of two noted scholar, scholarly historians, Herodotus and Zephon, Zeph Zephon, Ze Zenapho, I don't know. If you want the notes, email me. It's also found, obviously, in the book of Daniel. That's the most reliable source of all. May I remind you again of the, wor of the words of God in Isaiah 45, verses 1 through 6. This is the big one. For, my ja for Jacob, my servant's sake, and for Israel, I have even called you by your name, that you may know that there is none beside me. God went on to actually identify the name of Cyrus 150 years before he's ever going to conquer this city. And specifically, it says here in, verse, in Isaiah 45, verses 1 through 6, that the reason he did this is so that his people would understand he's God, he can predict things, and you can trust his message. Neat, neat prophecy, isn't it? Now, again, there's so much more that I, I could do, and I, I'd love to do with, with this and on the subject of prophecy, but next week we've got to move on to a, another topic. But I, I just ask you, does that not tell you that there is a God in heaven who can predict stuff 100, 150 years before it ever happens, even call specific people by name, tell you exactly how they're going to conquer a city, etc.? He's an amazing God. You can trust his book. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. Okay. Questions, teachers, get your, what do you recall, the phones out and take a picture of this. How does uh, biblical prophecy Prove that God is in control of protecting his. That sounds like last week it is because I want you to repeat that one. This one's not, though. Can you list five specific things that Isaiah predicted over 100 years before they even happened? I just gave you a bunch of them. Students, were you paying attention? And then number three, this is just a review, but it's a very important review because we've covered three areas now that you can know that God's word is accurate. Number one, can you list me just one example of parallels in the Bible, times that God lays two things beside each other, parallels? How about one example of priming? When he just reprimed the pump, we got the message going again. And then lastly, uh, other than Isaiah's prophecy about Cyrus, which we just covered this morning, last week we covered a bunch of stuff. Can you give me one example of prophecy in, in the Bible? Do these evidences cause you to trust the Bible even more? Why? Good stuff. Can the Bible be trusted? You know it, buddy. And so we need to get after not only promoting the Bible, but obeying it and making it the core part of our life. All right, I went over, but I needed to cover that. Good, good stuff. Again, teachers, if you want those specifics, let me know. Send me an email, and I will uh, send it back via an email uh, to you. All right, next thing we need to do is have a time of prayer, and we have several things that uh, are on my heart, and uh, they need to be on yours as well. Iliad passed away. Iliad is now with God, and uh, his parents have rejoiced in that. Uh, that, that he's with God. Uh, obviously, it's a very difficult time for them, however. Um, I pray that you will pray for that that family. Uh, wonderful folks. I love them very much. Uh, watched Iliad's dad grow up with my oldest son. Um, it's a hard, hard time. Wasn't even a year old. Uh, but God has taken this little guy home, and one day uh, we'll get to see him again if we live faithful. And so let's pray for family, the family of Iliad. Um, Ethan, this is one of my little buddies from my home congregation. Uh, Ethan has got various issues that are going on. He just made a trip to Memphis and uh, had some discoveries made about his condition and some things that are going to be taking place. And I, I just ask that you, uh, you keep Ethan in your prayers. Oh, boy, I don't know. Ethan must be, I don't know. You have to help me out here, Heather. Maybe 11, 12, something in that area. Please keep Ethan in your prayers. Good little guy. Uh, Denise. This is uh, 
again, the head cook for MAP and uh, her leg. Uh, so we got some good news that the insurance is going to cover a procedure and some of that's going to happen this week. So please keep Denise in your prayers. Uh, Denise from Louisiana has asked us to pray for her grandchildren. Many of us have their, our children and our grandchildren on our hearts. Please pray for them and their faithfulness to God in these last days. Uh, Brenda from Louisiana is uh, struggling with uh, some issues, pressure on the brain, etc. Saw an update, I guess it was yesterday. Uh, we need to continue to pray for her. This is going to be a long haul for her and her family. And uh, pray for her that God will give her recovery according to his will. Uh, let me get out of the way here. Tina, uh, and we, we've talked about all of these folks. Uh, Tina's not from Indiana. Tina's from Arkansas. I got that one wrong. And then Linda from Indiana. These are these two ladies struggling with uh, uh, breast cancer. Although they had a surgery on Tina and uh, they got it. They, 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 they say they got it. So we're praising God for that. And then lastly, my son is part of a traveling group uh, that went to Jennings, Louisiana this weekend. And they're finishing up right now this morning. Um, and after services, they will be heading back up here. It's a seven hour drive, something like that. And, uh, a lot of crazy people on the highway. So if you would remember my son and our youth group as they are traveling home from this youth rally, that would mean a lot to me. So there's your prayer list. Um, if you've got other things that are on your heart, um, send them to me. Uh, again, first name, state. And, you know, brief sentence as to what's going on, or you can send me all you want with regards to what's going on, but I'm only going to probably give a, just a real short sound bite with regards to these things. But uh, a lot of folks watching, we understand that there's people actually in the, around the world who uh, are tuning in on occasion with these live broadcasts. So a lot of folks could be praying about your situation. And so if you'll let me know what it is, I'll try to make sure that... Uh, we bring that to the attention of those who watch us on Sunday mornings. All right, I got about three minutes before I transition into the sermon time. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to get our sermon time set up. But I want you to spend the next three minutes praying or discussing other prayer lists that you, prayer things that you need for your prayer list. Good morning. Time for the sermon segment of Lord's Day Live. Appreciate all of you who are along for the ride. Uh, if you were there for the class just a few minutes ago, you saw a really awesome prophecy from the Old Testament. Isn't God cool? 
Today, in our sermon time, we're going to continue the topic of those other steps that lead to salvation. And uh, so, let's get on with the sermon this morning. Um, when you deal with these other steps that lead to salvation, as I, as I said last week, it's important for us to, you know, recognize that they are there. And you and I, we're going to, in fact, I was working earlier yesterday, I was working on this last one. We'll deal with baptism, but our fellowship, you know, we tend to spend a lot of time there. And we will. Uh, next week, we'll spend some time there with regards to the subject of baptism. But let's not forget that this really doesn't matter if you don't come through a hearing process. You can be baptized into a lot of things, but if you're not baptized into Jesus because you heard about him, then what good is that? You can believe in a lot of things. Even the demons believe in God, but if your belief doesn't lead you to an action, then an appropriate action, then what good is your belief? Repenting. A lot of people repent from a lot of things that are secular. They go in a different direction. You know, I'm going to lose weight this year. <clears throat> not that that's a bad thing, but that's not going to get me to heaven. So you got to repent for the right reasons. And then this morning we're going to deal with confession. What needs to come out of your mouth? Uh, what does it mean to confess, uh, etc.? And so uh, that's the journey that we are taking. By way of review, remember, here, everyone is called. And so everyone hears to some degree, and there's the passages to suggest that. But there's only a few who actually listen to what the, the, the Savior is actually saying. Romans chapter 1 often, or indicates to us that man is without excuse, not because God doesn't speak, but because man doesn't pay attention. Everybody hears, but not everybody listens. Uh, number two, we talked about belief. Everyone believes, according to Romans chapter 1, which I was just talking about, that therefore man is without excuse. Uh, but there's only a few who believe fully. James chapter 2 says that your belief has to go beyond the level of demons. Demons believe there's a God. They've got full confidence that there's a God. And so just because you say, I know that there's a God, doesn't really lead, that's not, doesn't give you too much, you know, bragging rights, if you will. Uh, if you, if you want to, to come to a level where you can actually have security in your own value system, uh, you need to get to a place where you believe in God and that causes you to do something. And that gives you security in God. Uh, and so oh, there's only a few who believe fully, meaning that they don't allow their beliefs to bring them to complete obedience. Uh, and then what about repentance? We talked about that last week. Everyone repents. Romans chapter 14. Uh, everybody is going to, at least eventually, uh, everyone is going to acknowledge that Jesus is uh, the Christ, etc. But only a few repent in time. Uh, I had a teacher in college years ago who said that death is the great sealer, meaning that once death occurs, your timeline, as far as the human history is concerned, it ends, and your condition is sealed. No longer do you have opportunities to, to make changes. You, you can't repent, because once you're dead, you're dead. And at that point, you enter into a, a condition that is se secured by whatever you did when you had opportunities to make decisions. And Everyone is going to repent eventually, but that repentance is going to take place in Romans 14 that's being talked about there. For many, it's going to come too late because they didn't repent before the great sealer. All right, this morning then, we want to talk about confession. Confession. And I'm going to make the same two points that I've been making throughout this particular series, but um, Romans chapter 14 and verse 11, it says this, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. I don't know if you've ever stopped and just really considered what it's going to be like on that day, when the masses of all humanity who have ever lived are gathered in that one place. I think for many of us, we're going to largely be witnesses. Um, for for many of us, uh, the whole scenario is going to play out in such a way that uh, much of, of what we're talking about has, has been already dealt with as far as our condition with God is concerned. But we know that Jesus says that the masses will not accept him. The gate is narrow, and few there be that, that find it. And so it's going to be a it's going to be an awesome, haunting at least in the moment, time for those who are part of that great throng and hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. I don't know what it's going to play out, how it's going to play out. Will we visually be able to see the open pit that they are being cast into? I don't know. Um, how will all the, the scene transpire? I, you read the book of Ezekiel, you read the book of Daniel, and you find some really awesome descriptions of God's setting. 
And uh, I suspect a lot of that's going to take place. Whatever it is, all of us to some degree are going to have our heart in our throat. Even those of us who know that we're we're righteous and we're going to spend eternity with God, it, it, it's got to be one of those wow moments. Uh, and it's going to be just overwhelming. Well, in this passage, he says, as surely as I live. In other words, as surely as I am God, as surely as I exist, and we know God does. He says, as sure as that is, he says, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue will acknowledge God. I believe that even includes Satan and his angels. I believe that you're going to see one day, whether from the faithful side or the unfaithful side, you are going to witness the great throngs of humanity as they kneel, confess, acknowledge. I was wrong. You were right. I just didn't pay attention when you were calling to me. And I suspect many of them will plead. I suspect many of them will beg. But as I said, death is a great sealer. And their fate will have been sealed. All of us confess. All of us. But not all of of us will confess in time. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, 32 through 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. This is another one of those haunting passages. Um, I saw some pictures just this past week of some individuals in uh, some, it was a Muslim country, and there were some Christians who had been hunted down, and they were literally hogtied, uh, and they were on their way to execution. And I, I thought of this passage. Those of us who will maintain our faith, we will confess Jesus before men no matter what it costs us, no matter how much it hurts, If we will maintain that faith, Jesus then will stand before his Father and he will say, that one's mine. But if we deny Jesus, he'll say, that one's not mine. And I guess the most sobering part of this for me is that you're not hogtied. Most of us who are watching this this morning have never really experienced true persecution. Oh, there's been an occasion where maybe somebody laughed at you. You might even have lost a job or a job opportunity because you were a Christian. But as far as real persecution, being threatened with prison, torture, losing your family, I doubt many of us watching this have ever been there. There might be some, but not many of us. Certainly not myself. And so my big application is this. What makes me think that if I were hogtied and on my way to execution, that I'd have enough spiritual fervor to maintain my faith and to confess Jesus right up into the end. If I can't do it now, when I live in the midst of all of the conveniences that I have. We are truly a blessed people. And in some ways, we are obese with regards to blessings. We just have so much that comes our way that sometimes it forces us into, I don't know about force, that's that's too strong. It, It prompts us into a condition of passive, just go through the motions, other things are more important. It's Lord's Day. And some of you are sick and you're watching this. And God bless you for tuning in and being with me. I'm appreciating that. Others of you have other things, other responsibilities. Maybe you're working in a nursing home or a a hospital or whatever. Your job requires that you just can't be with the saints this morning. Maybe you're trying to be there tonight, whatever it may be. But if you're laying in your bed and you're thinking, you know what? I've had a hard week. I just think I'd like to sleep in this morning. Then I'm going to ask you a really personal question. What makes you think that if you can't get out of bed and go to church this morning, that you're going to have enough savvy one day when persecution really does come down upon us that you'll be able to maintain your faith. We are, we, are, we are such a pampered group. And yet, in our being pampered, we claim such great spiritual maturity. If you can't confess the name of Jesus now in the midst of all of your conveniences, it's not likely you're going to confess him, confess him in the midst of all the conflict and problems that could come upon us being that we live in the last days. He says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But folks, I'm telling you, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before God. 
Those are the words of Jesus. If there's one thing I take hope in, it is that in that great scene that I tried to describe to you earlier, when we come into the masses of folks who are being escorted over to that pit and fall into the eternal hell forever, if there's one hope that I have, it is that I will be able to stand there with confidence because my Jesus has done claim me. Why is it so hard for you and I to confess? Much like all of the others that I have pointed out in this series, choosing to confess, it may very well be one of the most difficult things we ever do in life. Why? Because by definition, confession requires an act of openly admitting surrender. I take you to social media. Did you, did you ever notice on social media how rare it is for somebody to actually apologize? For somebody to actually say, I got that one right. I'm sorry. Let me correct the record. It happens. I had some good friends who did it this week when they jumped too quickly on the bandwagon criticizing that, that young man from Kentucky. Uh, but it doesn't happen very often. And the reason is because we, as humans, are full of ourselves. And we... We don't like saying I'm sorry. We don't like saying I'm wrong. We don't like to learn, especially when we get to the age when we're adults. You know, nobody's going to teach me nothing. And yet that same attitude seems to be getting younger and younger, doesn't it? How many young people do you know who just treat you, even though you're much older than they are, they just treat you like you don't know anything? Where did they learn that? We have to exercise a greater degree of humility. We have to exercise a greater degree of submission to the will, no matter, even if it causes us to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. One of the reasons confession is so hard, when it's really confession, is because in the midst of confession, I have to say, mm, I was wrong. Mm, you're stronger than I am. Mm, you deserve to have attention. I deserve to stand here in the background. And nobody wants to do that, because we're so full of ourselves taking selfies that we just don't, we don't want to take the time or we don't want to give up the, the moment of fame. And so we, instead of confessing, instead of owning up, taking personal responsibility, we sit back and we just say, you know, the devil made me do it. Or let's not talk about that. Let's move on to something else, which is one of my pet peeves, by the way. I debate a lot of folks on online, especially with regards to Calvinism. And whenever they're cornered to a point where they have to submit to what the Bible says, first thing that they're going to do is change the subject we got to be willing to just own up to it. If the Bible says it and I ain't doing it, I need to, what, i got to go with what the book says. Let's give you three suggestions with regards to defining confession. And all of these, of course, are going to come from the Bible because I'm a kind of Bible guy. I let the Bible interpret the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. As you study Scripture, you find the term confession that comes up several times. And one of the things that, Bible does with regards to defining confession is it tells us, number one, that confession has to be an open admission. An open admission. I admit it openly. Notice this passage from 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But we've got to be willing to confess it. That particular passage, by the way, seems to come in a context that is emphasizing perhaps one or the other, but it seems to be emphasizing both. That this confession thing is not just a confession necessarily to God, but it's also a confession to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Because our support group includes both the divine and those who are created, created in the divine image. And so our confession needs to be a open admission. Um, it's kind of like what you've seen perhaps in your own congregations where somebody will respond to the invitation, to respond to, to the gospel call, and in the process they will say, I'm sorry, or I have done this, or I whatever. Um, addictions. Uh, you go to a recovery program, and obvious, obviously one of the first things that they're going to require of you if you're going to be a, a viable participant is that you got to admit who you are. you got to admit where you're at. If you're not going to admit that you got a problem, why even be there? Well, the same thing, obviously, is true spiritually speaking. The church of God is full of folks who got problems. And we need to be able to admit those problems, not just to the divine, but also to those created in the divine image. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, he says we need to confess our sins. And if we do that, he, this one specifically with God, he is faithful, and he will forgive us of the, 
You see the process here. We're dealing with salvation. We have to be able to, we have to be willing to confess. Um, by the way, I pointed this out last week, but all of these happened before and after baptism. This particular one is written to Christians and talking about a confession that takes place post-baptism, post-conversion experience, which makes another interesting application, and that is that you and I, we've seen this happen too. Somebody, I've done it many times myself. Somebody responds to the gospel invitation. They sit in the front row. They're not coming here to be baptized. They're coming here to say, you know what? I messed up. I need my church family. Or maybe they're saying, I have brought shame and reproach upon my church family, and I need my church family to forgive me. That kind of thing is obviously being addressed here in this particular passage. So number one, confession is an open admission to something. Number two, it's also an open acceptance. It's not just that I admit it, I'm going to accept it. You know, a lot of folks are, are quick to say I'm sorry, or quick to say, yeah, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right. But then they don't really do anything about it. In the second step, you'll notice that there's an acceptance of something. This is Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If we confess, there's our word again. If we confess with your, if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What is it specifically we are accepting in this passage? Whenever I talk with somebody about becoming a Christian and we deal with Romans 10, 9, and 10, I, re I try to remind them that the confession process is more than just saying, I believe that there's a God. And it's more than just saying, number one, that I've got sin. It's also saying, Jesus is going to become my Lord. What does the word Lord mean? Master, ruler, boss, dictator, if you want. He calls the shots. And I don't question it. I get after the business. He says, jump, I say, how high? Because I'm going to be totally submissive to him. And so in my confession process, I'm not just going to admit that I'm a screw-up. I'm also going to accept that he's the only one that can solve my problem. And so admission and acceptance are significant parts of what it means to actually confess Jesus and uh, admit before the world, as we, we said, number one, accept that Jesus will be your Lord, number two. Number three, it is also open acknowledgement. First Timothy chapter three, 6, verse 13, Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, do you know Jesus even confessed? Yeah, made a good confession, according to what Timothy is saying here. So there is a, an acknowledgement of the divine, an acknowledgement of a, of a greater, superior um, power that is at, at work in my life. And so I'm acknowledging that. And just as I'm accepting him as the Lord, I'm acknowledging that. This is the very word, open. Notice I got in all three points, open, 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 because confession tends to be that way. Confession tends to be something that is not done in the privacy of your own bedroom. Confession is something that by its very nat nature has to have a receiver. It's kind of like communication. Just because I, uh, I say something in my head doesn't mean that my wife gets it. It's one of my pet peeves. Sometimes people try to communicate and they don't, you know, I can't read your mind. You gotta verbalize, you know, like we tell my little grandson Judah, use your words. Well, that's kind of what's happening here. Use your words, God says. I need you to go more than just something that's deep inside your heart. I need you to use your words. I need you to make an expression of what's going on. Uh, deal with something that ought to be uh, dealt with, I suppose, here. What do you do with somebody who is mute? Somebody who cannot use their tongue. Can, can they confess? Obviously so. I've seen many, many folks do this, maybe hundreds of folks who have done this, uh, who have responded to the gospel invitation, were not able to actually speak, but through sign language, whatever, they were able to make the great confession. I think the point that we have to understand and appreciate with regards to confession is that this is something that is expressed, that it is public, it's open, it's an acknowledgement Where's that? Acknowledgement, it's an acceptance, and it's an admission. I'm saying to the world, this is how I feel about this particular subject. These are the values that I am collecting to myself. And so confession is very significant on our journey towards the, the, the realm of salvation. And by the way, for those good Bible students, you're watching these passages play out. Obviously, it's also important in the realm of maintaining our salvation. 
For those who believe and once saved, always saved, I ask you, why even give this stuff? Why even talk this way? If it's all said and done, then why do we have to have admonishments about what needs to happen after it's done? Well, the reason is because you still have free will, and you can walk away because of your free will. You can walk away from your salvation. Therefore, once saved, always saved just isn't biblical. You're going to love this picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's yours truly and his beautiful bride. Boy, that's going back a ways. Uh, that's, that's Cindy and I. And uh, that, that's taken at the Center Hill Church of Christ in Paragould, Arkansas. It's now a funeral home. Uh, that particular building <laughs> where we're standing, they actually put the casket right there uh, during the viewing. Yeah, that's. But anyhow, I don't know what that says. But uh, here we are, and uh, you know, try to disregard the the geeky guy on the right. But isn't she gorgeous? Oh man, still gives me the all overs. But I want to talk about confession as I end this thing. As we stood on that stage, and we stood just like that, we, we did the number where we faced the audience. My dad was actually standing down here with his backside to the audience, and he's the one who married us, and he said various things, and, and we got to the vows, and uh, Cindy and I actually tweaked the vows from the book of Ruth, Entreat me not to leave thee, or turn back from following after thee. Whether that goes, I will go, and whether thou lodges, I will lodge. There are people who will be my people. Oh, <laughs> good stuff, I can still quote it. Uh, it's just awesome stuff. Of course, that was between, what was it? That's between a mother-in-law and a sister and a daughter-in-law. But uh, we took that and we tweaked it and made it into a, a, a wedding vows. But in that process, we confessed. And um, in the dating time that we had prior to that, we confessed. And after being married now for 30 plus years, we continue to confess. One of the things that we do, where's my points, is we, we make regular admissions. I can't tell you the number of times I've had to say, honey, I am so sorry. Because I'm just, I'm, I'm a go-getter and I'm a big mouth. And, you know, if something doesn't work, I'm, I'm all over it, you know. And, and if it doesn't work and I think that she's at fault, I'm going to get all over her about it. And I lose my temper and I... I can't tell you the number of times that I've had to say, I am a mess up. Please forgive me. But it's not just admission that we have faults, and it's a, but it's also an acceptance. I accept that that woman right there is number two in my life. Jesus is number one, but she's number two. And I've spent the last 30 plus years trying to make sure that she understands that. I accept that. Every decision I make, every decision that I make that's worth even talking about, first of all, runs through this mind with consideration to how is it going to affect that woman. And then the acknowledgement. The acknowledgement not only that she exists, but that she is mine. And that in our unique relationship together, our one flesh relationship, that throughout these 30 plus years, I have tried to acknowledge that I am there for you and I'm not going anywhere. You see, when we come to Christ, there is a marriage that takes place, literally. And these three things with regards to confession are a lot like the marriage vows. There comes a time that you've got to express it. I turn you back to that passage where Jesus says, If you acknowledge me before God, or excuse me, before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father. And how beautiful that is. Those individuals are hogtied, being led off to their execution in some of these Muslim countries, they are about to be introduced to one of the most glorious scenes as their Savior wraps them in his arms on the other side and says, well done, well done. But then there are those of us who live in the lap of luxury and conveniences, and we can't even find it within our spiritual savvy to accept Jesus when we're talking to our friends at the water fountain at work. Somebody brings up this particular topic and we just either ignore it or sometimes like Judas, we just verbally disavow God. May God forgive us. We need to be people who constantly are acknowledging. And so that's my challenge for you this week. Acknowledge Jesus. Confess him before the world. Especially in these last days, it is so very important. All right, one last time, sillingchallenge.com. I've told you this before, but if you'll go there, it will link you to some other things that you can use to get to some other lessons if you're interested. Um, you probably can see this if you're here in Bible class time. You probably notice this. There's like a film on here. Yeah. Well, I, we, Cindy, 
<laughs> Bless her heart. I love that woman. She discovered that film, and you can put it on your television, and you can actually write on the film. I love you. See how I'm right there? Right? I'm just writing right on my television. Isn't that crazy good? And then I can erase it. We're going to be able to use this in the future. because I love taking a passage of Scripture, throwing it up there and encircling words and showing how that word relates to another word within the passage. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. Good stuff. Hope you join me again next week for Lord's Day Live. But until then, I pray that you will confess God before men. Sonny Chow's be there, Matthew 16, 26.